So let's get into the uh, nitty gritty of the action. I guess some things will be say uh, you don't they happen in your space. Mm? I guess some please things we don't they happen in your space. Maybe say it they make me the ask. I not say you. You will come come here and say eh? I need you to first of all pledge. I know what some you swear. Pledge. Say you go answer my question in the right way. You not go play politics with me. You not go play diplomatic card with me. Now they know with they. Let my listeners they happy. Say they. they now I know you are Don't dribble me. Oh, I beg you. Say you they hear me. I must speak about show Bonnie. So help me God. <laughs> because I know you. I go ask you. Okay, I go ask you one question now. You can't use the tactics. You can't use meandering, meandering. You call meandering me. No, don't do me that today. Okay, so straight away. Now from Brazil, you begin to teach me now. Let me, let me teach me. Let me teach me all this while. <laughs> I don't teach anyone. Go away. Uh, okay. But <laughs> nah, this is not fair. Shay. This is not fair. You're taking my shoe. This is my shoe. You're taking my shoe away from me. Okay. So let's start with uh, a couple of months, especially during the COVID 19, the heat of the COVID 19, between March, April, and May. There was this serious argument in, you know, in England. Um, John Barnes, Jimmy Floyd Asselberg, so Campbell, you see all the names, all the mentions, so they resemble you, so you already know where the argument will go. Uh, my, mm -hmm. my, my club legend too, and right, all of them join the conversation, and uh, politics too, uh, join, they, they don't give black people a chance, black people don't get chances, this, 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 this. So I can't say, but two Nigerians don't get chances. So she of in China, they work with wolves. Uh, it may not long work 10 years with Chelsea. Now, what I worry myself also gets a chance, a person of Kolotori. They work with Brenda Rogers since from uh, Celtic, now at Leicester. They just went to Rikondo uh, some hours ago. I'm asking, Shay, how you take get this job for us? And please, no come with that Nigerian thing. That Nigerian answer, not give me Nigerian answer. I beg. How you think get this job? Because I'm very sensitive, sensitive um, job. Well, I think it's there. It. It's, a, it's a very sensitive job. And um, let, let, let us face it. Um, I've said this to a few houses and I continue to say it. You see, we need to, uh, you know, we need to put our house in order until we, as Africans, in terms of football, do what the Brazilians did, whereby every Brazilian wanted to leave Brazil to go and play abroad and play in Europe, in the abroad, like, like they say. There came a point in time where they went back home, they, they developed their football, they, they, they pumped a lot of money into the football in such a way that Brazil became a very, very viable place to play football. And if you then want to go to Europe, if your club wants to go to Europe, they better pay the top dollar for the player and for the club, thereby allowing blooming circulation of money within the yeah. economy. Until we begin to do that, things like we've been talking about will continue to happen. Now, it will be foolish of anybody. This is my own argument, please. I don't, people should shoot me down or say whatever they want to say. But as Africans, would we, if Africa was to be Europe, would we be saying the same thing we're saying? Would we be allowing these guys the privileges we are asking for? I, I, I play with some wonderful, wonderful players who are not English, whom on the back end of their career had to go back home and they held big positions back home. Some of them are head of recruitment for their national team, for, their, for big clubs in their country. It has become a little bit difficult for someone like me to go to, back to Nigeria to do it. And until that begins to happen, whereby charity they say begins at home, we should be able to finish and then be going back home such that when they deem you good enough to stay, it's a different conversation rather than, I bet you're not going to take me this moment, I'm not going to hang for years long. Well, I'm not going to go back house. You know, in my own case, you have said to me not to, not to say, not to talk about grace. So, but grace has played a huge part. In it, grace oh, plus God. plus preparation. Oh, preparation, no, no, seriously, seriously. Okay. Preparation in, in the sense that, you see, while we continue to play footballers, football players, yeah, 
the onus is on us to comport ourselves and to see a life beyond that particular moment we are playing football. If I'd done something wrong in, for Wolves, for Cardi, for all the clubs I, I was privileged to have played for, I wouldn't be knocking on the door to go to come back today, today, say I want to do have a role. So the first important thing we need to sort of think of is comport ourselves while Absolutely. we're playing the game in such a way that look, um, pedigree is, a very, is going to be very, very important. Your, your personality, not faking anything, but again, be good to people that are giving you the opportunity to show you to okay yourself and then pay you a lot of money to sort of enjoy your hobby. That's how I put it. Yeah. Such that when the times like this will come and then you want to come back, the opportunity is always going to be there. The door is always going to be open. Okay. In so, my own case, very, very privileged, very, very, uh, again, you, you get given the opportunity, but preparation during my playing days made this possible for me. Okay. So, you don't say, uh, you get one big word we use now, uh, na grammar. You say comportment. Comportment, if it just be just a word, a vague word, we, a lot of people might not understand. But you see, I'm saying this because I'm part of the narrative. You are part of the narrative. We've been we've been holding this conversation down now for this is 2014 to now. This is six years we've been talking like this back and forth behind the scene, but we're not bringing it to the public. Sometimes people don't even know how to comport themselves. I had a conversation with Judah J. Gallo the other day, and I don't like using young man to describe people. The, the, the guy had a, he already had a plan for a couple of years ahead of him. I spoke to another Nigerian guy. He might not be the most popular guy. Alex Akande is in China also, he's a footballer. Have a very great plan ahead of him in terms of investment, in terms of business. But then your kind of job, you are actually the loan and pathway manager of Wolves. In, in, in layman English, what do he mean? We say the destiny of young players for Wolves, now your hand is D. Young players when they come, when they make them into the first team because of the senior players who did it. Now your responsibility to go out there, go look for club. Not, not just to look for a club, but look for the right club where we say their system will suit the development of a player in such a way that if Una decides, okay, we want to call this guy back, he will easily be coming and fit into the first team. That's one. Secondly, if that's okay, uh, you don't develop, we want to sell him, we go fit sell him and, re and retain value. I don't know if we, if I did this, if I did explain your job description well. Now you're 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 spot on. You're spot you on. are not a dual citizen kind of person like oh is a Briton. If my man come from England or if papa come from Europe, you be almost Niger hundred percent. How is it that wolves look at everybody? Now there's this thing where I'm driving this point to is before you even finish your career, you were a footballer with a master's degree, and a lot of people will always say, you know me, especially in Nigeria today, where you see. Uh, a professor can become a back career for a school sat holder, a PhD holder can become a driver. And then, you know, the, the, the silliest mistake to make is to use those examples to say, eh, I beg you, what is the use of school? When you go to school, finish, hush puppy will make more money than you. But in the real world that we live in, where hard work pay, where consistency, where doing the right thing is the real thing. And that's the major story that we don't get to tell. Can we safely say that, Shayo Love in general, one of the reasons why Wolves, look, say, okay, apart from say you comport yourself, apart from say you behave well, apart from grace, where you want to bring in, so or Sarah, whoever you want to bring in, your educational qualification also join for what to make the compute. Because for that play, you go to write reports, you go write letters, you go write proposals, you go attend meetings. You have to have the brain. Did that contribute or not just your football qualities? And I give you that job. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a total package. You see, um, there's a saying. There's a saying. It, it takes um, it takes a whole lot of um, uh, people within an organization to build an organization. It only takes one idiot to spoil the culture, to ruin the whole thing. Yeah. And clubs are very, very mindful of who they bring into position, especially position of authority, position of such that I I occupy today uh, by, by God's grace. So. It comes with a pedigree, it comes with preparation, education, football, and everything. But again, again, it comes with the daily, I use that word again, daily comportment. So when Eshia Lovijano went to Wolverhampton Wanderers after my football career, I told them straight away, I wanted to be a sporting director. Where do I start from? Okay, 
what are all your coaching badges? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I've done my A license. I'm going to do my UEFA Pro license while I will continue to work. Well, that's, that's fantastic. So you're well prepared already. You're, you're on course. Okay, why don't you go and handle our 16th? From 16th, you handle the, the, the 23s, and then you begin to get assignments from the sporting director and then the, 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 the owners of the football club to sort of develop you to, to, to the next level. Because yes, coaching might not be the ultimate thing you want to do, but again, it forms a big part of the whole thing you, you, you're, going, you're going to do within the football club. And a lot of us, this is, this is a topic for another day anyway. A lot of ex-football players think because we have played the game, then we know everything about coaching. Coaching, manage, management in football and playing football are two different things. You are just fortunate to be working within the same industry, but they are two different things. You need to learn, which was what I had to do initially. So on the back end of that, because I wanted to be a sporting director, the loans manager role came up as um, made mandatory by the, by the Premier League for every Premier League club to have the loans manager. I said, well, it's a good role for me. I applied for it within the same organization. And I said, yeah, Shay, you're perfect for it. Perfect because it's, it's, it's one step before the next sporting directorship thing you want to do because you're going to do it with transfer. You're going to work, work with the recruitment team. You're going to work with the media team. You're going to be responsible for players, both senior first team players and, and junior players with regards, like you said, their destiny. Where is the next best thing, best place for them to go to in terms of club and development and what have you. And all those things took a while to sort of fathom. But again, learning from those that have been there before, working day to day with the sporting director and being, not being frightened to sort of delve into it and, and go and deal with it uh, was what I did initially before I, I mean, got to this point. But again, it's about trust. It's about checking that Shei is the same Shei we used to know, and now he's still is a better version of himself. Now it's not just so because oh yeah, I played for the five games for the football club. I played over two two games for the football club. That gives him the, the right to to come in. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. If you don't have the qualification, and again the the, the, the pedigree to do the job, you, you don't get a point. Okay, so I'm one of those people, and black people hate me for this for saying this all the time. I'm one of those people who see that. Skin does not have anything to do with it. It is qualification, pedigree, and trust. And you just mentioned those things. Wolves is a very, very important club in the football history and football organogram of England. And I, I tried to do a whole lot of back-end research before this interview started. Now, when you walk in through the door at Millionaire and you walk in, you, you're missing up with people. Do you feel less of a person? Like, do you have that feeling in the corridors of power? Like, oh, no, he's a black guy, so we can't trust him, we can't have him around. Do you feel that, oh, when you're walking, you know, I'm walking into my environment where I walk, and I've earned the right to be here, and people treat me right because I've earned it. And when they discipline me to, it's because I've done something wrong, not because of my color. Does that happen? I a mindset. I think you, 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 you go to work, you go to places like that, you go to the modern year where you have thousands of people going there, believing I'm here not because somebody has helped me, I'm actually here because I'm qualified to be here, which is, which, which is um, my strength when I did, when I did analysis about, about my personality comes from, comes from knowledge. I'm not the type of person that would just do something off the cuff. I need to be very, very sure of what I'm doing it is my core strength really. And as long as, long as I have that knowledge and I know I'm qualified to do that, I don't care what everybody's thinking. Life is all about perspective. But again, it's easy for me to say that because I'm, not, I'm working now for a club I've played for where a lot of the fans, a lot of the people within the football club know me. If I were to be working for a different organization whereby I've not played before, I had to sort of end my metal, it's a different conversation. But again, with that, I've got, I've got degrees to back me up. In terms of this same industry, I've played at the highest level. Nobody can tell me anything about football that I've not been through before. And on the other side, I'm, 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 I'm qualified to be here. So by right, I deserve to be there. Okay. So let's go through the day-to-day -day workings of your job uh, for the ordinary person. Because, okay, this is also a new role in football. When me and you, when we're playing football, this role was not there. This is a new a new role now in football. This used to be a job that the coach, the manager does, like an extra one that the manager does. Oh, I know this person, please, hello. Can you take this player on loan and, and see how we can do it? And then you talk to the management. But now this is a specific, like a specialized role. What is the day-to-day -day requirement of the loans uh, manager at Wolves for Cheyo Love in general? Well, yeah, around now, we are busiest when it's um, when the transfer window 
is open because then you need to find opportunities for players. You need to. I'm, I'm at the training ground every day because the players you want to market, you better be there to sort of know the day to day. Are they injured? Are they training well? Like what type of what what's, what's going on? Even though you have prior knowledge of the players, you need to be there on a daily basis to see to, to to monitor them. And when they're training below par, you need to let them know because. Is at the end of the day, you recommending them to clubs is your word against them. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, the club is you're saying to the club, "This player is a very, very good striker. He can do this. He can do that." When he gets there, you better do it because the next time you pick the phone for another player, they will listen to you. So as well as you want to put the players in a good light, you want to be truthful with the club. Mention their areas of development. Mention their strengths and what have you. Let them know beforehand what they what they're getting, so that when they get it. It's not like, oh, but he told, he told me this guy is this, so it's right footed when it's left footed and all those stuff, sort of things. So with, it, with regards to that, I need to be on the training ground on a daily basis for the 23s, for the under 18s, for the first team, monitor what's going on, speak to the manager, speak to the head of recruitment, who are we letting go, is the manager, are we bringing anybody in? Because they, all these jobs, they overlap. If we're bringing, if we're bringing a, a mystery player in, that means another a mystery player within the first team squad might be surplus to requirement and might need a loan. And I need to know to, to then begin to make phone calls straight away. That's why it's a day-to-day job. Now, when the window closes, monitoring starts. So all those players are out on loan. How are they going? How are they doing? The with regard to the contract that they've signed, some will say, "Well, you pay us minimal amount of money. We don't need the money actually, but we need the, we need game time for the player. So the better the player has to be has to be playing, and you need to be working with the club secretary to then monitor how many games they're playing. Some we have triggers within their contracts. They play 20 games." then there's an option to buy. It's my responsibility to know how many games those guys are playing. It's a law. It's a whole law. Accommodation, contracts, all sort of things needs to be monitored for individual players. Last season, I had 24 players. So you can imagine. Within that, you got to travel. This week, I'm in Portugal. Next week, I'm in Switzerland, going to watch games, going to see how they're doing. As well as speaking to the, to the, to the club and seeing how are things going. Are they, if, I, if they're injured, I need to know straight away and then find a way to sort of get them back to our club. It's a whole raft of things that, that, that it's doing on a daily basis. Okay, so, uh, and that also includes uh, paperwork, that also includes relationship, because Yellow of Injana needs to have a high dose of contact. Uh, you have to have, when you check your phone book, your contact must be very heavy because not everything the club will do for you. They provided you with job, provided you description, provided you office and staff that work with you. Uh, how do you go about picking the club where your player, your developing or surplus to requirement players are going to go to. How do you, like, do you pick a phone, pick your phone and you call, let's say for instance, you call a coach in France. Does he know you? How do you know all these people, all these places to send the player to? How do you get to know them? Now you're going to Portugal, you're going to, how do you know these people? Yeah, well, it's, it's just contact, you know. There are certain, there are certain, by the virtue of the fact that I work for a Premier League club, there are certain bodies you go to that you can get access to, the, to these numbers. But again, um, there's this forum we, 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 we have in, in Europe at the moment called the Transfer Room, where all the sporting directors of all, almost all the clubs in Europe meet and convert. As a matter of fact, the next one is this coming Wednesday, and we, we meet, everybody meets in person. Well, not now. We're going to do a virtual one, not virus. But normally we'll, we'll go to... For example, we'll go to Barcelona, one, 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 one event, and we'll just meet and talk about players, exchange contact with the people, so that when you pick up the phone next time and you're talking, at least you, you, you know the person you're speaking to because you've met them. Yeah. Apart from that, there's, there's, a, there's an inventory, there's a directory where you can get to. The club secretaries are, are a big help in terms of that. And again, when that's part of my job when the window closes. What are the clubs that are playing our system? It is my responsibility to sort of familiarize myself with those clubs such that when they are needed, I've developed a relationship with them already. That is the pathways that comes with my role. So it's not just loans, but loans with the pathway. And it's my responsibility to sort of find well-meaning and um, same system playing clubs to sort of partner ourselves. Okay, so uh, in the future, we might see you in a football director's role. So one of the role of a football director, at least I, I, mean, I work with a few people like that, so I know, is to know the kind of player that they will sign, interface with the coach, the head coach or the manager, let's say, in your case now, Nino Espirito Santo, uh, work with him and say, okay, what are the players you need here? What are the players you need there? Like you have uh, people like TK Bigiristan in, uh, in Man City and Colorado and the rest of them. At that point, 
of negotiating because we always have this conversation that people say uh, the coach has spent 200 million the coach has spent 500 million and i'm always worried because i know that coaches don't sign players it is a club that sign players and that argument always go back and front please can you help me put this issue to bed when it comes to signing at least you sign for different clubs as well when it comes to buying a player is it the coach that is 100 percent responsible for buying a player or the coach, you know, make a recommendation, I need a defender, and then the club goes and negotiate and decide to pay whatever X, Y, Z amount of money. How does it work? I mean, in the current day, maybe because I'm not a layman, I don't know anymore. Stop playing since 2000. And that's like 20 years ago. So I really need to know. Of course, of course you know, you're trying to help a lot of people who don't know. That's why you're asking the question. That is why we're doing what we're doing. Okay. So it's, it's a yes and it's a no. And again, the, 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 the answer is in the title. If you notice very, very recently, the best one that comes to mind straight away is the news that went on just this last week about Ateta becoming a manager as opposed to head of coach coaching. Yeah. I'm not sure if you got that. I saw it. I saw it. So, the, so a head coach, a head coach is just supposed to coach the team, get the best out of the team and get results. That's the difference. A manager has a say in who comes into the club working with the sporting director. So if, if you see somebody start to say he's a, he's a head coach, all they do is recruit us for him into that team where he just coaches the team and get the best out of those players. But your manager has a say as well as coaching the team to sort of get the results. And that's right. the, role. The, the role of the sporting director is a link. The sporting director is a link between the hierarchy, the, the decision-making arm of the football club and the operational side of it. It sits in between. Now you work hand in hand with the head of, head of coaching or the manager to get the best players in without altering the structure of the football club, which is essentially the work of the sporting director, such that if Ateta leaves tomorrow, if we're employing somebody, he has to be somebody with similar ideas to Ateta, such that we don't lose the philosophy of the football club. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's take, uh, let's take it down to Nigerian players a bit. And uh, uh, some time ago, we did an Instagram live and we talked about uh, ex-international players feeling entitled and all that. But uh, do you monitor Nigerian players? Like you have um, people like uh, Judo J. Gallo in England, uh, you have quite a few other players. And then there is a table here. There is your, your young boy who, uh, who adores you, Taiwa Woni. And then there's Victor Simeon who's in Napoli and all of these guys. Do you sometimes sit in your office at your spare time and monitor Nigerian players and try to see their development? Because there's a possibility that one in Nigeria will just call you and say, you know what, Shay, you have too much experience. I bet come and work in our system. All this money that we're spending, we think you deserve it. Let's give it to you. Come and be the coach of the national team or come and run the technical department. And do you take time to watch them, study them, and take notes on what might what might be if the opportunity comes up? Of course, first and foremost, I mean, I mean, I'm Nigerian and I remain Nigerian. It doesn't matter how much, I mean, how many passports I, <laughs> I get during this for John, you know, but I'm still Nigerian. I will, I will continue to be, to be a Nigerian. I love Nigeria to bits and I, I follow the players. I follow the Eagles, I follow the under 23, under 17. I follow, I follow all, all of our football, the coaches, appointments, and what have you. I don't get myself too involved in it because I don't think it's my place to do that. Now, from my active playing days, now I have become a fan again. I just watch support yeah. from the side. But again, I monitor all the players. This, this, this starts on the, on, on the table or off, I mean, from the scouting department almost on a, on a weekly basis. So why, why not? It makes sense to know who is, who is where, who is doing what, who is playing games, who is not playing games, who is scoring all the goals. Okay. Uh, there's this thing we talk about scouting. And sometimes they, you buy a player and then the player doesn't perform and then they say, oh, the scout is a problem. And then let me use the one that comes to mind. Memphis is the pay was scouted by the Manchester United uh, scouting team. They signed him. Uh, he, he, came to, he came to Manchester United, one and a half season, didn't do well. He was sold to, to, to France for Lyon for a court price. Now he's the player that everybody's talking about for Barcelona. And some conversation is that, oh, the scouting department did well, but the coaches didn't use him well. Uh, the, the scouts didn't, didn't, didn't do their job well, and then he didn't fit in. All of these things. What's the blame that comes to a scout when a player that is scouted by the scouting unit didn't perform well? Do you really, do they put the blame on the scout or it's because the system they fit the player or sometimes it's the player that takes the blame? 
think it's the dynamics of the football club. The dynamics in the sense that we just said something about the role of the sporting director. We highlighted the role of the manager and the head coach. If I were to become a sporting director tomorrow, I wouldn't say because I have the, the, the voice of the owners of the football club or, or whatever company and then not carry my manager along. I think it, it, it should be a symbiotic relationship. At the end of the day, if I sign a player, if the manager doesn't, does not play the player, I'm not Canadian. So uh, the sooner absolutely. I have him buy in, into the process, the better. So that we can have a look at the player together. We can see how he fits in, where he fits into the football club, and then begin to sort of help the player going forward. Yeah. Sometimes players, a player doing well in France, the, the big problem is knowing how we fit in, in England. Because, yes, yeah. the French league might be a little bit um, slow. The player might be suited to that environment. When they come to England, it's a different ballgame mentality. But everything is twice as quick. Can they cope with, with such things? We might have to go and have a look at them in an international, international duty. We might have to have a look at them in, in Europa or in the Champions League. Just watch them in different environments. Go on the days where you just watch a player two or three times and you say, yeah, you think you can sign for football club. We monitor players sometimes for two years. Just wow. keep watching, keep watching. Those attributes that we've seen them perform, can they do it under pressure? Can they do it in different scenarios? Can they do it internationally? Can they do it uh, in the Champions League where it's a European tournament? Can they do it in all kinds of ways? We need to sort of tick a lot of boxes before it gets to the point of actually saying, I'm recommending to the, to the manager that we want to sign a player. So, okay, so player performing is a collective thing rather than just an individual thing or a departmental thing. Okay, back in the day, transfer was very straightforward. This club wants this player. They tell you, okay, we'll pay you this money and then the deals are done. I was reading and write transfer story and a few other players and I'm sure it was the same thing with yours. But today, you negotiate the players, uh, do an agreement with the player, separate, do an agreement with the club that owns the player separate. You are not going to negotiate again with the player agent or agent fees and all that. And then your lawyers, your retinue of lawyers, and then submitting of documentation with the FA. How cumbersome is a transfer? Like if a transfer is going to happen, you've, I like, you've scouted the player, you've highlighted the player, your manager has also agreed that, okay, we need this player, I'm on board, we need this player. How difficult is the process? Because sometimes I hear fans get frustrated and hey, we'll be linked to this player, we'll be linked to this player. How come we've not signed the player? What is happening? And then give me a detail, uh, a normal average run from agreeing with player, agreeing with agent, agreeing with the club, doing medical and unveiling the player. How many days can that take? <laughs> There's a lot of work that go on behind the scene, uh, so to speak. Of course, we, before you get to it, a place where you start linking a player to a club. Like I said, there's been a lot of raft and raft of scouting reports that must have gone in, that must have given us the, 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 the say so and the go ahead to say, yes, this player might be for us. Before he begins to go on the media, before he begins to sort of get to the fans, that's the advanced stage. The work has gone in behind the scenes to get to, a, to that level. Yes, you get the odd one that, that those ones are classed as opportunity. All of a sudden, a player that you think is out of your reach and out of your league became available on the free. Yeah, that's a different conversation. Straight away, yeah. there might be an opportunity there. Those ones are there. But the real ones that you're looking for, you actually take time. Because you see, a lot of money in football these days, you don't want to throw 20 million away by signing a player who doesn't fit into your system. Where, where's the player going to go? It's on a huge amount of money. But again, these are all the things you mentioned that allows the deal to go through, that allows the player to perform or not perform, or not allow the deal to go through. Okay. We, as a football club, you must work with the agents. Agents are very, very, they are necessary evils, I call them. Yes, they, they are. are. Very, very, they are key because the information, they carry the, the information they have a lot of the time, you might not have those information. How much, how much would the player expect to, to earn? How much would the club want for him? All those information, you know, nine times out of ten, you find out from the agent. Because then you begin to make up your mind, would this be a player for us? Would it fall into our budget, our pay bracket? If not, it doesn't matter what the player is doing, it's off our list. Start looking at ones that we can afford because it's about a little bit about affordability. Yeah, about structure, affordability, and rest. Now uh, let's come, let's come down to the, uh, the, the, the the this thing they call tip uh, markings for matches. Like the fist just comes out and you know that you have thirty eight games to play Wolves, and the first target is we would not we will not go on relegation. Then the next target is we would finish above the top ten. Uh, then we would, we would try and qualify for Europe. Last season, Wolves, now let's center on Wolves now. Wolves tested Europe 
and went very far, quarterfinals or so, in, in the Europa. Now, what is the energy in your dressing room when the fixtures was done? Is this, do you see, go back to that red tip of uh, let's get past the 40 point mark first? Or no, we are wolves now. We played Europa last season. We have a lot of Portuguese players in this team, a lot of foreign players. We can do what the Chelsea's or Manchester United or Arsenal and Man United, uh, the Man City and Liverpool are doing. Let's go 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 and try and do a Leicester. Is that the feeling? Or you still carefully crossing the, the dot and saying, first, get the first three points, get to 40 points, and then whatever comes in is a bonus. Football clubs always have a realistic target, realistic in the sense that there are statistics that tell you where you think you may end up. Everybody wants to be first, but that's not realistic. You know, when the likes of Chelsea are spending almost 90 million buying a single player, quality player, you know, getting Thiago Silva for free, and, and you, your club is not doing an awful lot, that tells you the, the level. And from that viewpoint, you begin to sort of put points together and then begin to look at the league. Where and where can we get a, get a point? Where can, where, where, can we, where can we get three points? Put all of those together and see where you end up. Now, if you can go beyond that, it will be a bonus. But this will be internal discussion. Obviously, to the fans, to everybody on the outside, we try and play it down as much as possible so we don't sort of set the expectation too high and all of a sudden we shoot ourselves in the foot. So, for, for example, for the target for Wolves has always been to be one of six. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, but again, for the benefit of those that are listening, I'll say. But again, it's, it's a gradual process. A lot of people will look at Wolves last season and say, oh, quarter final of the Europa, yeah, if they had done a little bit more, maybe they should have, could have gone to the final. For us, it's a success. Because the journey of football is such that you go slow. If you go too quick, you will come down too quick. It will affect a lot of things. You sure. grow, you consolidate, you grow, you consolidate, and you build slowly. So sure. now it's a question of, are we got enough money to sort of go again? Can we make addition? Can we, can we, instead of having 20 players, can we have 25 good players such that we can cope with, with, with the cup games, with the Premier League and with Europa qualification if we're there? You know, those are all the things that determine where you get to. You might fall short, but again, there are targets based on the parameters. All right, uh, Shea in general, it's been very, very nice talking to you. I always know that I was going to have an intelligent conversation when I get you, it's not an easy thing to get you to agree to do an interview, but you, I mean, you're part of this company, so you supported us from Grand Zero up, or part of the persons who nudge me like, guy, why can't you do it yourself? I mean, the people that, I remember this one you said to me, the people that are doing it, do they have the two heads? I, <laughs> I laugh, I was like, bros, you don't know how much evolved. And you said, no, it's not the money first, it is, um, uh, what do they call them? It's the passion it, and the desire. It's the passion and the desire to, to go and do it. And I said, you know when you say something to somebody and the person is arguing with you, but on the inside, there's a part of him that is saying, okay, uh, what is this? Okay, so somebody said that they just gave their head coach a new contract at uh, your new coach, uh, Nuno Espirito. Somebody said they just gave him a three years contract. A three years contract. Yeah, that's true. So it means that you guys are going to uh, be working together for a long time. Now, let me, let me get into your relationship with him because I kind of like, like the man. You know, it's the kind of guy that I want. I like his energy, his attitude, his pomp. Comparing him to other coaches that you've worked with at different clubs, do you sometimes wish that, oh, I wish I was playing for this man? Do, do you get that kind of feeling sometimes? I, I, I've said to a lot of the players that are playing these days, yeah, we, now we do all the work and then we get all the benefits now. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so structured, it's so detailed, it's so professional, the manager, everyone is clear on what you need to do and not to do. As a matter of fact, it, it wouldn't matter if you have scored a goal, but you've gone out of your mark, it could change you out of the team. Such is how much the value structure, but off the pitch, very, very, very cool-headed guy, very, very quiet, very, very professional. I haven't got time for tantrums and jokes and what have you, but again, very respectful. Get on with his business and get on with his job. Okay. Uh, there is this thing people say about coaches. And, and I, I've seen a few of the all or nothing clips. You know, coaches come to matches looking prime and proper, but in training, you see them using foul language, F word, go, go ballistic. <laughs> uh, in your playing days, 
who's the most ballistic coach you worked with in your playing days? For me, it was one coach in Sweden. God, that guy will cost. It's not. It's not costing you because he's he hates you. But I think that's just his thing. He's talking to the club president. He's cursing. Like it's like Mar Mauricio Sarri. So I need to know who's the most ballistic coach you work with. Like he can't stay without going crazy. He can't stay without losing it. That's a tough one. I worked with I worked with a few to be fair. I mean, believe it or not, assistant managers are worse than managers. Oh my days. Forget about the big names, it's the assistant ones that in fact they are almost more passionate than even the managers. But the one that comes to mind is Mick McCarthy. Assured, speaks so well in the media, but oh my god, when you enter that dressing room, God help you, you've you've you you have you have done well enough. If you haven't, you you will get to know about it. But again, another thing I like about him is the fact that he can cause all he wants, he can do everything he wants, he can tell you how it is. Monday morning will be the best person to say good morning. Oh, that's that's that's, 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 that's lovely. That means it's just about the job, nothing personal. Which is what I love and anyway. which is what I love. Yeah. And then in your playing days, you play as a midfielder, defensive midfielder. It means that there were a lot of duels. The premiership will never be complete without talking about the duels between Paul, uh, Patrick uh, Vieira and Roy Kane. But most times we forget about a whole lot of people, Haaland, all these other guys that were really into duels. Can you, who are the players you played against and it was bone to bone? In what we will say, who go to go? Who are those bone to bone players that you played against? In terms of energy. Yes, in terms, in terms of, of aggression, energy, energy and all that. Who? Steven Gerrard has got the law. He's got everything. Steven Gerrard. Wow. Oh my God. That guy could run. He could run, he could tackle, he could do anything, he could shoot, he could head. He was unbelievable. You could be speaking to him now about the game is just, the ball is just going up or in, and you, you think that start chatting to you in the box. Where is this guy? He can't go. No, 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 no. He's no. not just to talk for you. He's so energetic. He loved Liverpool. Oh, my God. But the best of the lot for me, and in saying the best of the lot, I was very, very fortunate and privileged. I played against some wonderful players. The best of the lot is Paul Scholes. Wow. Talk to me about Paul Scholes. Talk to me about Paul Scholes. Because a lot of people, a lot of people in this generation don't know Paul Scholes. So they know Paul Scholes, they pond it. And they kind of like try to rubbish him sometimes. Me, I, I, I reverence for school. So, because I watched him play from the, the beginning. And I know, oh God, those shots, those, those missiles, those ah, balls from corner kick, and he meets you at the point of your knees, and all those things, spreading passes left and right. But you know, in these days, in his day, they were not really celebrated. Because he doesn't, he doesn't come with play, but he just get the job done. So talk to me about the for schools that you played against. How good was Pascal? Pascal's, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me put it into the context. I was, again, very, very fortunate and privileged to play against both Ronaldo's, played against Messi, played against Ronaldinho, played against Paul Lampard, the lot. Um, so for me to have singled out Pascal, he, he, must, he must tell you something about that guy. He's always two, three moves ahead of the game. If you get close to him, he plays one around the corner. If you leave him far away, he pings the six. He just... He, I'm not sure I can do justice to explaining Posco as a player. He's energetic, how he receives the ball, half turn, and oh, that guy was just phenomenal. He was just phenomenal. He was so good goals as well. So in the Miffy, they say that uh, Miffy and attack, uh, it, this is what somebody once said that when he was compartmentalizing uh, football, he said in defense, you need strength. Okay? In Miffy, you need all of your brains. And then in attack, you need just your instinct. So, talking about the midfield position, is it really about your brains alone? Like, is it, it by the way you think, when you took, look at Pascal, Zidane, Xavi, Andres Iniesta, these guys, it seems like they play the game 10 moves ahead before the ball gets to them. Because some of the things they do, they could put a pass in a place where there is no, like if you track back, I'm going to look at the game, there's no player there. But they put the part there, within second, their teammate is there. Is it that they play the game in their head? And you are a midfielder too. How do you cope with dealing with that? How you think? How does a midfielder think in a, in a football match? Yeah. The, the, the football 
on the football pitch, it's like um, it's like a music department, and the and the midfield players are orchestrators. They are the ones that determine how the music should be played. If they want to quicken the music, they can take it up. If they want it to slow down, they can slow down. So you must be very very clever and very very intelligent to do that. Back in the day, you needed physical big guys who just broke things down and all that. What you? These days, you've got to be very, very clever. Look at what Neves is doing for Wolves at the moment. It's not the, it's not the most mobile. It's not the most, it's not the quickest, it's not the most physical, but there's something about knowing where the ball is going to land before it lands and you're there before it happens. The real fairness of Manchester United of Oaks wasn't the quickest, but they, they, they just knew. Guys knew. You know, in, in, in the instance, you know, Zavi, Zavi is, is one of the shortest military players <laughs> to have played the game. Yeah. But the game has been so developed in such a way that while they're using all their brain to sort of make things happen in possession, out of possession, it becomes a collective. Rather than expecting Xavier to start chasing somebody down to the... No, 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 it's a collective. People come around him very quickly. And rather than marking singles, you're marking units and in chains. So, so that's, that that's, that's what's bringing me uh, maybe to the next to the final question that I'm going to ask you. You see, in Europe, you guys train with the ball, the field and technology. There are people, there is a department that do analysis, analyze the player whether this guy is running. You know, back in the day, you can say, oh, I run 10 laps. We used to measure in laps. I run 10 laps. Okay, this person is quicker than me. But these days, you are measured in minutes, in meters, in, 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 in pace. So there is a computer printer that tells you what you did on the field today. Now, in Africa, Nigeria, for instance, we don't have that. How is it that we're still able to leave Nigeria and go to Europe and make first thing? You know, because... Some of these young Nigerians, they just go to Europe on trials and they are displacing first team Europeans who have the, the opportunities, the field, the equipment. They train with all this equipment from infancy up. How have we been able to displace them? I think more than anything is the passion for the game. Let us not forget that it, your average African player can play football three times a day. I'm sure you did the yeah. same. Yeah. You go play side, you go, go play side for money. You still get match for evening. Sure. So when you go to play sets for money, you play, 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 you come house, you relax, chop small. You don't carry your bag, you don't go for evening, go play. So all those things, it's, it's, it's now in the measurement mm -hmm. of what is required based on certain scientific permutation and combination that these guys have come up with. That's the difference here. Okay. So when you, you might have played again for 90 minutes and they look at your HML, high metabolic load, and we have about... This is what you normally cover. It's not good enough. You can top it up. That's why you always see after a game, they are doing analysis and you see some players running on the pitch. Yeah. So for, for you, if you have played for 30 minutes, you have not done the same thing as somebody that has done 90 minutes and you need to make up for it because you might be playing again on Tuesday. And if you are needed, you better be ready. So those are the things. We are missing the specifics of what is required, but we make up for all those things by playing without any form of measurement for, for yonder. Okay, so finally, on um, game day, because I'm all about the game day experience, and I always talk about that. Now we are we're going to be producing uh, matches for the Suru Liri League. The, the game day experience, uh, I've been part of a backstage production for Alibaba's, uh, Alibaba Seriously at the Quarter, and it took two days, 48 hours to set up the stage, get everything ready. That's minus the planning from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. When it comes to game day, how does a, an average Premier League team, because you play for a lot, you play for Wolves, you play for Stoke City and the rest of them, how does an average Premier League prepare? What time do players wake up? What time do they eat? What time are they not supposed to eat again? How does the preparation go before they go to match? Because I interviewed Omero the other time during the, 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 the lockdown, and he mentioned one thing that was very fundamental. He said Midros grew, missed that on promotion because they left the hotel late, and then there was traffic in London, and then it affected them. By the time they, they got to the stadium, they were like panting, they ran into the match, the other opposition was ready. That's how they didn't gain promotion. So how does a normal match day preparation, precision from waking up in the morning, run me through the whole rundown, the itinerary of a match day for a team like Wolves or any other premiership team? I think it's different from, for, for different teams. It's just the, the, the key word there is the consistency, which was what Omero was alluding to. There's nothing yeah. wrong in coming late because you're going to play in London and then you're running to the pitch, but that tilts the norm 
So normally we won't be running. Normal, and the brain starts overworking, which is what people out here are always after. It's about doing the same thing. It's just like practicing how to sort of do pull-outs. The more you practice, the better you get. So it's about that consistency. You know, for us, when I played it, a lot of the clubs I played for, as a matter of fact, you have your nutrition, t- I mean, uh, uh, statistics of what from Monday. So when it's getting to game time, when it's getting, and you have a, you almost have a routine of what you eat before the game. So the, normally you eat three hours before the game. Breakfast is always optional. If you're playing away or playing home for, for teams that stay in the hotel prior to their home game, Breakfast is optional. If you want to have breakfast, I'm not a breakfast person. I don't even get up. I just sleep because I probably will have been studying all night in the hotel. So I just sleep in the mornings. But 11 o'clock, we go for a walk because you need to go for a walk to see how everybody is to get fresh air in your face. And 11.30, you have your pretty much meal, we call it, your routine. If you have pasta, if you have egg, whatever you want to eat, that's the time to eat it. Then after, straight after that, we go for lunch analysis. So we go to for video analysis, we talk about everything we've worked on in the week. Let's remind ourselves in possession, out of possession. Then from there on, what's everybody goes to on, on the van, depending on how far the, the stadium is. And you go to the to, to the game to, to play the football. And it's almost similar with every football club with how, with how they do things. So it's in the consistency. Some will want to get to the stadium an hour, an hour before. Some will have there two hours. As before, those days, but whatever they do or whatever we did back in the day, it was always consistent. All right, thank you very much, Shia Lofinjana. It's uh, been a great time talking to you. Uh, before I let you go, I won't let you go without asking about Taiwa when he because uh, he left his German club as he is today. We saw a picture of him training with Liverpool. Uh, I know you're committed to Wolves, you shouldn't be getting involved in other clubs, players, or he's your son. Is your boy. Where is the likely place that Taiwan won't even be playing this season? Or this season? Sorry. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough ask. I, Taiwan won't even well an agent. I'm not an agent. I'm, a, I'm very, very fortunate to have been the director of an academy that's holding to Liverpool. But in saying that, I mean, the Liverpool guys, I, I'm friends with them, so I'm always in touch with them to see. And monitor his progress. You know, when he's looking for another opportunity, either to be sold to another club, either get an opportunity to, to play for the Super Eagles to have a number of caps, such like I can begin to, to back to play for, for, for Liverpool to sort of qualify to get his work permit, or actually to go out on loan again and see what happens. Um, Brexit might be a good opportunity in the sense that it becomes a different ball game from January coming, where the opportunity to get your work permit might be a little bit, the, 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 the terms might be a little bit reduced. And from that viewpoint, it might qualify to play in England, which, which is something he really wants to do. Because he's spoken to Klopp, Klopp a, lot, a lot of times. Klopp likes him, but again, he can't, he can't come back and play for Liverpool. So it's a, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one, one that we're monitoring very, very closely. But again, it's a club that's going to give him an opportunity to play, to develop. I, I, I see a young man that was given the right opportunity, given the right club, given the right environment. Can thrive, can, can, can do so well even for the Super Eagles. All right, let's hope that he gets that Super Eagles chance. Uh, I mean, I had a chat with him. We still have an ongoing conversation. And I love I, I love his demeanor, his personality, his attitude. It's something that I, I really love. I think it took a whole lot from you because I could see a younger version of you in him. And you always say, no, he should be better than you. But that's a very, very high mountain to climb. It's not easy to, to beat Mr. George. It's not easy, but I hope he does. I mean, he's able to do that. But thank you very much for your time. And uh, for your sake, we are fans of Wolves. What we would ask you is, please, when you're coming to Nigeria, eh, help us get a jersey, a Wolves jersey that is signed by all players of Wolves. We're not going to give it out. We'll hang it on the wall of our radio station, put it in a glass, frame it, and put it here. That uh, people who, listeners will say, at the bed now. Yes, at the bed. I know get levels. I need a shame for this one. But not just bring the jersey, get them to sign it. And if possible, get a board that we'll put in the studio, a Wolves board that is signed, autographed. That's the word they use when we sign it. Autograph jersey for us, I'll put on the wall. But thank you so much for your time. And uh, we will still call you in the future as the season begins to grow. We'll still call you with so many other things to talk about. But thank you very much for your time. And we pray that when you become a sporting director and grow and grow and grow, and reach the very, very zenith of your dream as a club administrator, and people would also learn from you that it takes a lot, like you said, comportment and all of the things that come with it. 
Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so very much. Let me once again congratulate you for opening the studio. Uh, we had a little yeah. chat all those years back. <laughs> you know, you're taking the word, and all of a sudden, it has become something wonderful. It's, it's, it's the beginning of something you don't even know how where it's going to get you to. I you know, actually thank you don't very much know. for listening. I thank, thank you, you for taking the, 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 the leap of faith, and you know, let's see what God is capable of doing. Thank you very much. God bless you, my brother. Thank you. I have a lovely day. My regards to that, your son, that is always reading my message on you. <laughs> On your phone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Amy. I will. God bless Thank you, you man. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. God bless. Bye. Bye.